Good morning, well, or afternoon or evening, depending on where you are. This is Carl Polachuk, and welcome to the first part of a two-part webinar series that we're doing uh, on hiring in SMBIT, and in particular, in the, at this point in time. <laughs> so uh, this may not be useful five years from now, although I think some of it we'll look back on, and uh, if I'm right, uh, it'll seem prophetic. And if I'm wrong, people will just you know forget that I ever said anything. So that's cool with me. Anyway, welcome. Uh, it's great to see so many people uh, registered and online, as well as I always like seeing a lot of friendly faces that I know, and and I like seeing absolutely new names that I've never seen before. So welcome to uh, my little piece of the universe. For those of you who are new to me, I uh, started out as a managed service provider, and we're going to talk a little bit about the trail I took. But uh, I got into writing books, helping other uh, IT consultants run their businesses. And so uh, my most popular book in the IT world is Managed Services in a Month. Um, many of you have read that. I've written about 20 books in total, and so a lot of the um, information that we have is available at IT Service Provider University, where we teach classes. And then all of the uh, information I've ever created, I'm, I'm I think most of it is up now, but we're going to put it all up at smallbizthoughts.org. That is a membership community, a paid membership community. And we would love to have you uh, join us there as well. I'm the only sponsor today. So this is, we're going to call this November, December, uh, as we go through this. Um, the format is basically, I'm going to, I'm going to try to cover everything I have in about 45 minutes. So, uh, and I'm going to talk really fast. So if you're listening to the recording, you might want to put it on, you know, 0.75 or even uh, half speed. Uh, we will leave time at the end for questions and answers and then a discussion. Uh, I have some ideas about where I think uh, we can go as an industry and the kinds of things that we should be looking at. And if questions continue past the top of the hour, I will continue to hang out and answer more and more questions. Now, I'm not a fan of chat. I think chat is enabled. And if you choose to chat amongst yourselves, by all means, you go ahead and do that. <laughs> I don't have my chat window open. I, um, I pay attention to the Q&A. So even if you want to make a comment like Dennis says, howdy, uh, then um, you can put that in the Q&A and I will actually see it. So this is part one of two webinars. This webinar, which is uh, specifically in answer to uh, requests from my community. I asked Kara, our community manager, um, you know, what do people want? What, what are people begging you about, bugging you about, uh, asking for? And she said, information on hiring. And in particular, the challenges that we're going through today, uh, trying to get technicians. Hiring is like, it, it used to be getting new clients, which is now slipped from one to two during this <laughs> period in our history. Um, but today it's it's hiring. And so uh, part one is about the challenges we have today and some ideas about how to think differently about our market, probably for the next five years. Uh, and then um, the uh, part two is going to be next week, same time, same station, and it will be uh, all about the, the details of defining a job, setting up job descriptions, advertising, interviewing, like everything from, hey, I think I need to hire somebody until the day that they show up for work. Uh, and that is basically uh, the missing piece of the content on employment that uh, I have uh, a missing piece inside my own community. So this webinar that you're listening to today will be posted and we will have a replay and it will have the, the um, you know, all of the, the video and the whole deal and the slides to download. Next week's webinar, you must watch live if you're not a member of my community. It will be available to everybody, including the handouts, if you watch live. 
Um, but if you want the recording or whatever after the fact, that will only be available inside the Small Biz Thoughts technology community. So uh, anyway, that's just that's just the way the world works. As uh, uh, MX says, membership has its privileges. So today I want to talk to you about rethinking who we hire, how we hire, and how we train and and therefore retain employees. So uh, we're gonna we're gonna with luck, you can hold me responsible for those three things <laughs> by the time that the hour is up. So we'll start with some statistics. So this is as of last week. Um, so the number of businesses, when we talk about what is a small business, 71% of all the businesses in the United States have fewer than five employees. So when people talk about, you know, micro businesses or small businesses, that is not a put down, that is not a let down, that is almost every business in the world. And, you know, in countries that are um, less, I guess, economically strong than the United States, uh, I believe that what you're going to find is that even a higher percentage of businesses are in that one to five employer range. Uh, and then when you add them up, and you say, well, what about one to 99, basically that one uh, under 100 employees. Well, that's 89% of all businesses. And so it's, you know, it's not 89% of all employees, but it's 89% of all businesses. So the whole mid-market and enterprise, you know, enterprise, the over 1,000 seats is less than one-tenth of 1%, or it's just over one-tenth of 1%. It's like 0.13% uh, of all businesses. So when we talk about small business, we're basically talking about everybody. And the reason I go through this is that when you when you look at the numbers of actual employees, not businesses, well, the under 100 represents about 32% of the U.S. employees. Uh, and the medium, the, the 100 to 499 is another 16%. So what that means is that 48% of the employees are in businesses that are under 500 employees. It also means that 52% uh, are in those bigger businesses. And so we need to rethink who we are looking for, um, you know, in terms of who our uh, potential markets are for hiring technicians. What we have often done is to have uh, we, we go look in the pool of people who are already MSP technicians, and then we're basically stealing employees from each other. And so I want to look at some other ways of looking at the world. Um, so there are 585,000 tech companies in the United States, um, and there are about 4 million jobs available. Now, when we say tech companies, you have to be very careful about that because almost every company on earth hires technicians, even though they're not what you would call a tech company. So for example, is Bank of America a tech company? Most people would say no, but yet they hire thousands of technicians, right? Um, think about you know the, the, the big businesses like Facebook, right? Facebook is not a tech company. Facebook is a social media company, but it has a lot of technicians. So when you hear in the news that, you know, this company or that company is laying off, uh, whatever, 1,400 people, they're not laying off 1,400 engineers. <clears throat> they're laying off people who are middle management, people in accounting, people in other roles, and so forth. Uh, and the article that's quoted here um, it was from, I think, September. And they estimated that the U.S. would create 178,000 new check tech jobs in Q4. In other words, uh, in the the last couple of months, 178,000 new technology jobs have been created inside the United States. So there's a vast vacuum of uh, unfilled jobs. So they're all stealing from each other and driving up prices and making it difficult for you to hire a technician to at a reasonable price to run 
your managed service business. So we need to rethink how we hire and where we look for uh, people for our businesses. So I'm going to give you some advice, and I have to say, many of you will ignore this or just say, oh, God, so don't ask me to do that. Do not ask me to do that. I have a way that I want to do my business, and you, you are going to make me change it. And I just encourage you to try to be open-minded about the things that I'm asking you to do. Even if you don't adopt it, just consider uh, the big picture and whether or not there's a, a change that would make sense inside your business. So the first thing, and I, I have been, <laughs> I've been asking people to do this literally since 2008. Stop uh, asking for things on resumes that you don't need. And the the this came from when we were the it was basically a buyer's market, meaning that um, there were lots of people looking for tech jobs, and uh, the the employers could be very picky. And so, in that buyer's market, they would say, "Oh, I must have a bachelor's degree." Well, okay, you know, let's be honest. If you're going to set up a Microsoft 365 account, you don't need a bachelor's degree. If you're going to set up a SQL server, you don't need a bachelor's degree, right? There are lots of things where there are so many people with degrees that a lot of employers have just said, hey, this is an easy way to uh, reduce the number of resumes we receive or to filter through them really fast. So they put in these requirements that don't make any sense, uh, right? It's not, it's not related to the job. <clears throat> you are more likely to say, must have 10 years experience with this technology. And I'm sure you've seen the meme on Facebook and other places that, you know, hey, the, I was asked for to, that I have 10 years experience in this technology. I invented this technology four years ago. So <laughs> no one has 10 years experience, right? So when you think about that, look through your advertising and, and make sure that you are asking for things you need, but not asking for things you don't need. This is huge. And if everybody did this, we would suddenly find that we have a lot more resumes to look through. Also, I think that you need to create uh, training programs. And if you don't create them, then you need to buy into them. Uh, one of the ways to get around you know, having a degree is to say, okay, I've got the training, but I don't have the experience. And I have had tremendous luck hiring people who uh, are interested and have the aptitude, but don't necessarily have the training. Uh, I even hired uh, one technician one time who uh, was a night clerk at uh, a hotel and had, you know, basically taken all of these classes over years and years and years and certified himself up. And I don't think he was an MCSE, but he had five or six Microsoft certifications when he came to us, but he'd never had a job in tech. So he knew the theory. He just needed some hands-on to see how things really worked in the real world. Uh, we hired him, took a chance on him. He clearly had the aptitude and he had the interest and the motivation, and he turned out to be a great technician. So, um, you know, think about how you can put together training programs. The, the best people in our industry, the best employers in our industry have some kind of training programs for their employees, whether it is every Friday afternoon or once a month on Friday, uh, you get together and do some training for your staff, or you pay for uh, certifications from Cisco, or you uh, pay for people to take classes at community colleges or uh, you know whatever. They've got some kind of program. And very often it is literally like, Look, on Tuesday at seven o'clock at night, uh, we're all going to get together. We're going to order pizza and we're going to learn this new thing that we've decided that we're going to sell, right? So it can be in-house or it can be something that you buy somewhere else. Um, and the other thing I would say is it is okay to require these things, even in a tight market, you have to have people who are trained on the products and services you sell. And to be honest, one of the things that that not very many people do, my company does this, but um, uh, it's not available in a lot of places, is what is the managed service business model? Uh, over at ITSPU, IT Service Provider University, we have a class which is called Foundations, which is free to anyone. And it is basically the introduction to the managed service business model, like sort of 10,000 foot overview. Um, 
when I say you can require things, uh, a great example is that you can say, look, to pass uh, you know, your, your 90 day evaluation after you've been hired, you must have this certification, whether that is CompTIA, you know, this plus or that plus or a Cisco certification, whatever it is, uh, pick a certification that you believe is important to your business and just say, you have to pass this within 90 days or you don't get to keep your job. And you have to be willing to enforce that. But my experience has been back in the days of the small business server, uh, I would require that everybody became a small business specialist. So they had to pass the 70-282 exam and they all did it. We had one guy who had a little trouble, but basically every technician that we had passed that exam within 90 days. And then I also said, and any other exams you want to take from Microsoft uh, or Cisco or uh, CompTIA, I will give you a, a wage increase. Um, and only two people ever took additional exams. Uh, one was my brother who became the president of the company. And the other one was Mike, who uh, ended up taking over the company, buying the company uh, when it was time for me to sell. So those two people who had a very owner's mentality uh, certified themselves up. Everybody else uh, did what was required, but didn't take exams past what was required. So if you want somebody to be trained up, you must require it in your business. Uh, and again, you have to be willing to enforce that even in a tight job market. So second big piece of advice I would give you, stop giving non-technical work to senior technicians. And, and I would say this will probably save everybody on this call tens of thousands of dollars a year if you just do this one thing. You can hire an admin or have your office manager set up the, a new client. When you look at your, your new client onboarding checklist, whatever that is, look at all the things that don't require technical knowledge. Setting up Microsoft 365 accounts does not take any technical knowledge. Uh, setting up users on cloud storage does not take any technical knowledge. You know, some of the stuff that we think of as technical, you know, uh, who has access to which files, that's a matter of, you know, having somebody fill out a table and then having an administrative assistant apply the security privileges. Um, again, not a technical thing. So, um, you know, way back uh, when we had uh, Continuum and we had at one point uh, four admins in-house, our rules were first, if it can be done by Continuum, send it to Continuum. And second, if it can do be done by an administrative assistant, give it to an administrative assistant. Uh, and in general, back in the day, we were paying $15 for an admin and $20 an hour for a technician. So, you know, don't, don't take up the time of your precious technicians on things that are not technical in nature. <clears throat> Uh, and finally, you know, when there's little things, you know, there's stuff like, oh, somebody needs uh, their, their printer reconfigured or they need a printer installed, right? Don't have a senior level technician do that. Like we have not, for the most part, needed first, second and third tier technicians in the small end of the IT market. Even though a lot of companies have that, they don't really need it. And when they look at it, they don't really use it very much. And what ends up happening is, that they give piddly little jobs to senior level techs. Stop doing that, right? It's sort of like, you know, if you think about a triage system, <clears throat> I was just watching a uh, an old TV show and, you know, people stopped dying. And so they're like, oh, we have to reverse the triage. Since nobody's gonna die, let's take care of all the people who have minor injuries first and get them out of the hospital so that we have more room for all these people who are not going to die, right? It, it's similar to that you need to get rid of all of the little bitty things as quickly as possible so that the people who have the highest level of skills can take care of the big things, right? So, um, and by the way, I'm happy to have you put in questions as we go along and I will look at them towards the end. So put in any questions you have. All right, so let's talk for just a minute and I want you to think about what was your pathway to becoming a business owner or to becoming, I'm assuming, you're, assuming some people here are business managers. <laughs> in my case, um, I started out working in corporate America 
Um, then I became an outsourced 1099, which means that I basically was working for big companies like HP, um, but I was not an employee of that company, right? And uh, and then I became the owner of my, of a sort of a this classic IT service provider or managed service provider company, which was not called managed services at the time. Anyway, uh, and then I it became a growing company, and uh, I think we topped out around 18 employees. Um, and then I did some coaching and writing, uh, started up a second managed service business, uh, did some training, and we'll see what goes on, what's next, right? So that was my path. That may not be, it's probably not anybody else's path on this call. Many people started out with a formal degree. So they, they went to college, they got a, a computer science degree. Then they went to corporate America, and then they became disgruntled because it sucks to do tech support in corporate America. Uh, there's too much pressure. There's too much work. Uh, nobody cares. Uh, there's no motivation. It's poorly run. And they give some of the worst tech support in, in the entire universe. Um, everything that uh, Dilbert talks about is corporate America, right? Uh, and so they got disgruntled. And so they became a technician. They, they got hired by an MSP. Uh, and then they decided to become their own uh, independent consultant. So they they started doing outsourced work for companies for hire, and then they became uh, uh, an independent consultant and an, an ITSP, right? So what's next? So this may represent some of the people on this call. Similarly, there are people who go to trade schools, and oops, that arrow should be pointing up from trade school to MSP tech, uh, and then they become an independent consultant, right? So some of you took that route uh, from trade school on up. Others started out as a hobbyist, and then they decided to go get a job as an MSP technician, and then they went to trade school and got a little extra training, and then they uh, took a job in corporate America and got disgruntled, and then they decided to start their own managed service business, right? What path did you take? And, and I want you to literally sort of think about what were the steps that you took? And there's many, many ways that people can get into this industry and start from, I mean, at, at 15, nobody owns a managed service business, I don't think. Um, so at some point, you graduate from high school, you graduate from college, you go to trade school, you go to college uh, in, in IT. Um, you know, what, what was your path? How did, how did you get here? And then how did your technicians get here? And what I want you to think about is, what are the various pathways? Because we don't currently have one pathway. And I think over time, our industry will evolve to have uh, a fairly common pathway. And it'll be that you start out as, as a hobbyist or you get some education uh, and then you become a, a technician, but you're an outsource. Uh, and maybe you skip the outsource and go straight to being an MSP tech. But somewhere in there, we need to have actual training and apprenticeship. And, you know, being good in anything, including IT, is a combination of your experience and your training. So what's missing in all of this is how do you take education and turn it into useful information? Uh, those who took, who got a degree in college in computer science will all tell you that almost none of it applies to running a managed service business. Uh, you know, being, being able to code, understanding how you build a processor from the ground up and the, the fundamental philosophy of what goes on inside a GPU is interesting and useful in some worlds, but it's not great for running a business in IT. So we need an apprenticeship, which means you need <laughs> An apprenticeship. You need a way to say, look, I will take people who have aptitude and interest and education, and I will turn them into experienced technicians. And you have to be willing to say that in part because you don't have any choice. When there are 4 million jobs going asking and people can you know, snap their fingers and get a better job tomorrow, uh, it will be very hard for you to compete unless you have some kind of training or apprenticeship attached to your business. Uh, I actually was uh, talking to somebody last week 
who is a security specialist. He's an employee at a major corporation. And um, we were talking about, you know, ransomware and this and that. And I said, you know, don't you like lose sleep worrying about being broken into and what's going to happen because they're going to fire the security guy as soon as there's a break-in and there's almost bound to be a break-in. And he said, well, two things. First of all, it is literally the case. It's not if, it's when. Every every company of any size will be broken into. And he said, in particular, uh, at the, the high end, uh, we know that we just accept that as a fact. And so we have contingency plans in this and that. And then the second thing is, if they fire me, I will get a job in a minute because there's such a lack of people capable of holding this job. And in the interview, I will just say, I gave them advice, they didn't take it. <laughs> and then they got broken into. And nobody's going to check up on that because we all have signed non-disclosure agreements. And so I will never be without a job, right? So tell your children, go into security. Uh, but but the point is that th there's all these vacancies and it has created a different work environment. And even though you're not competing directly with the big businesses, um, that work environment affects you even as a small business. So we need to rethink who we hire. And uh, it's really important that you, you stop hiring the same people that you hired 10 years ago or even five years ago. Look at what you need. Literally create a skills matrix that says, uh, I need people who can install Office. I need people who uh, can you know, manage cloud services or you probably don't need more than one person on your staff uh, unless you have over 10,000 endpoints. You don't need more than one person on your staff who is a guru at SQL or Exchange. You don't really today probably need anybody who knows the details and the guts inside of web hosting unless you are a web hosting specialist, right? So think about what you actually need. Go through your tickets for the last 12 months and just lay out what skills we need to finish this. You know, do we need office skills? Do we need printing skills? Do we need uh, network troubleshooting? Uh, do we need Wi-Fi skills? What exactly do you need? And stop asking for things you don't need. And you might say, look, this is a flexible thing. And, and you know, what I do in my ads is I put must have and nice to have. And then kind of extra bonus, hey, if you happen to know anything about this, just make sure you mention it in your cover letter, right? So redo your job descriptions. And we're going to talk about this in some more detail next week, but redo your job descriptions so that it literally points out, this is what I absolutely need because the job that you have is not the same as it was 10 years ago. And the skills that you need within your, your business are not the same. And I will point out, there's the, the, you know, the process, the can do and the will do. If you think of this as a triangle, the base of the triangle is process. The processes you have define the work that needs to be done. And you can hire people who can do the job. It's literally a matter of finding people who, even if they don't show up with the skills, you can train them on the skills. So the, the ability to do the job is always there. The, the volume of that triangle is determined by their willingness to do what you are paying them to do. And so if you have people who say, oh, I, I'm not going to do these piddly little jobs. You know, I'm, I'm a Microsoft certified professional. Um, I don't have to do that. And you have to pay me 70,000. Okay, sorry. Uh, you have to be willing to let those people go. You have to be willing to focus on people who are interested in doing the work and are willing to do it your way. Because ultimately, your brand depends on you finding a way to continue to provide consistent, high-quality support in difficult times, right? You've, you designed something uh, in a period before we had uh, an employment crisis. Now you need to execute and fine-tune that, right? So find people who've got the right aptitude and the right attitude, and you can train them to do whatever needs to be done. And when I say put technical prowess in its place, I mean, we have to get away from this mentality in technology that, you know, whoever whoever knows the most must be the manager or the owner. You know, uh, if you think about that, it's just silly. That's literally a way to limit the growth of your own company, 
Um, if you, the owner, insist on being the smartest one in the room, well, uh, you are limited by your ability to find people who are dumber than you, right? So stop it. Uh, you know, it's okay to say that my technology, my personal uh, knowledge is maybe a little bit older than it should be, um, but I'm also not the guy doing the work, right? If you hire technicians who are good at the specific things you need them to do, you don't have to have that knowledge yourself. That's what other people's children are for, right? Let somebody be the specialist in SQL and somebody else be the specialist in exchange and you be the specialist in running a business that's profitable, right? So don't worry that you are not the most technically capable person in your company. You shouldn't be. And I'm happy to argue with anybody about any of this. So rethink how we hire. And this is critically important. If you're only going to get one thing out of this presentation today, this is the slide. You need to find people who are in adjacent industries or have adjacent skills. So, you know, let's assume that you've been using the, the standard things indeed.com and monster.com and uh, whatever. And, you know, what you're getting there is all the other MSP technicians applying to be your MSP technician. Well, think about other ways to look at this. Now, when I say adjacent industries, uh, for example, we all complain about the people who install business machines because they know just enough networking to screw up your client's network, right? Uh, they go in and they somehow manage to turn on um, the uh, uh, routing services within a printer or a uh, multifunction device, and suddenly you now have two competing routers handing out IP addresses, right? <laughs> You're like, oh, wait, why is DHCP enabled on a, a printing device, right? And they they say, I don't know, it's just that's the default, or uh, you know, whatever. They're they're not idiots. They're really good at making that thing work, even if it destroys your network. But they're adjacent to what you need. Like the most dangerous thing you can do is let them work for somebody else and give them actual networking skills. But if they worked for you, you they, they have 80% of what they need to be taught actual real networking. And so if you say, well, I can hire this person, but my requirement, going back to an earlier slide, I have a requirement. You must get certified in TCP IP uh, in order to proceed to the next level right, or to, to stay employed. Uh, take people who are in jobs that probably pay less than what you are paying. You know, they're, they're under $50,000 a year. And say, look, uh, I know that you can learn these skills. Uh, I have hired people. I hired one person one time who uh, was the manager of a dry cleaning store. But she was so good at organizing people. And I literally, I would go in there and just watch her every time anybody had a question. You know, she was like one of those uh, gods that has 12 arms, right? And she's like doing all of these things at once. I'm like, oh, okay. She knows how to organize some stuff, right? And so I hired her into a management position and she had zero technical skills, right? So think about the people who have skills you need and can learn the last, you know, 10% or whatever. Um, and there's a lot of industries that are, are, are jobs that are like that. There's also related industries, right? So think about people who um, are doing things related to what you do, who might be the, the technical people in a pharmacy or the technical people in a bank or the technical people in pretty much anything out there. Um, and, and stop looking at people who are already uh, MSP technicians. You know, part of the bias of our entire industry of hiring is that we look for people who have experience in exactly what we are asking them to do. And I want you to go like one notch to the left or right and find people who are almost there and you can train them on that last little bit that they need. Again, I'm happy to uh, have you put any questions in down below? So a few great sources, obviously big businesses. Time and time again, there are people who go into big business and then, uh, you know, they get laid off. Now, some of them really honestly, deep in their heart, 
want to work for a big business. They want to get the big 401k. They want to get the uh, retirement benefits. They want to get the, uh, you know, basically limited to 40 hours and they never have to work a minute of overtime and um, they're not responsible for anything and blah, blah, blah. They get job security. They want all that. So even though they just got laid off and, uh, you know, the next tech company is going to hire them next week, they will put a resume into you. I would recommend you do not hire those people. What you want to do is you want to hire the people who are employed by big business, but don't want to be there. Often big businesses have really horrible culture. Um, they tend to give the worst tech support on earth. And the people who you see on Reddit who say, oh my God, I can't believe my company is doing this. It's just ridiculous. Those are the people you want to hire. Those are the people who actually care about the client, care about the end user, care about giving good service, and they know that the company they work for is incapable of doing it structurally. Go find those people. But you really need to weed out. You need to ask questions that get to the root of, you know, will you leave us the minute uh, another tech company starts hiring? Because right now, like, so I live in Northern California. So between the Bay Area and Sacramento, here we have NEC, uh, Dell, uh, HP, Intel, uh, Apple, all have a presence in Sacramento and many other companies, um, including E-Trade, right? E-Trade is a perfect example. Big, huge corporation, big technical staff. They hire whenever they need to you know, improve something, they hire a thousand technicians. Uh, whenever they uh, are not going to make their numbers for the quarter, they lay off a thousand technicians. So there's constant th this influx of change and change and change. Only a small fraction of those people would be happy working in a tiny, small business where they're going to be your employee long term. Hold on one second. So, um, uh, then there's adjacent industry. So think about the, these other skill sets, people who have the skills you need, but they might, they might literally be in selling lighting or they do tech support for a realtor or they do tech support for somebody else. These are people who, um, as long as they have some aptitude and some willingness to work in small business, they might make really great employees but it means that you have to do some training. Um, they don't, you know, they might be super good. They might have all the skills you need, but they've never heard of a PSA and they can't spell RMM. So train them up on that and just be committed that that's something that you need to do as part of your onboarding process. So I call this gold mining, you know, so go gold mining in your own town and think about like I just told you what the market looks like in, in Sacramento in terms of technology businesses. But we also have all the others. We have people who do high-end tech support for attorneys and accountants and PR firms and all kinds of other stuff. So what are the businesses and what are the markets around where you live and where might you go looking for gold? And I would recommend people who do healthcare IT, they already know about HIPAA. They already know uh, probably bigger systems than you work with on a regular basis. Uh, people who are in, in retail, you know, you go look at the Safeway. Somebody is working on the technology at Safeway, including massive cloud systems, lots of servers, right? They understand networking, right? Uh, if you have scientific research firms around, anybody who is doing tech support in education, now they, it might be hard to, drag them away unless you get a good retirement plan, but you know, uh, you never know, uh, right? So all of these other things, you know, the, probably the easiest, the most closely re related one, you wanna make somebody's day, go into a phone store and see if there's anybody there who wants a real job as a real technician. <laughs> uh, Cause they've been replacing uh, broken screens and you know, for 98% of their job and 2% and of it is doing something that's actually technical and interesting. Um, but they might have the aptitude it takes to become a great technician. It's just a matter. Somebody has to give them a little bit of training, create an, an apprenticeship program, uh, and then give them a significant raise in, uh, in wages. So bottom line is 
take a look at new places where you might be able to find potential employees. And, you know, I, I promise you, this is not going away soon. You know, when you look at the news, the headline is that, you know, whatever, Google laid off 1,400 people. The reality is they didn't lay off 1,400 engineers, right? Amazon is laying people off on one hand, but they're about to ramp up for the Christmas season, right? Uh, so all of these companies are distributed all over the United States. Almost none of them have only one office in only one location. So you hear about Amazon is in Seattle. Well, yeah, if Amazon was in Seattle, it would take me four days to get uh, a light bulb delivered, but I can get it delivered in four hours because they have distribution centers everywhere. All of those distribution centers have technology, which means they have technicians. So think about all of the places where you can go gold mining within your own city. Um, and again, this is something that uh, I don't think you need to you think about this as a short-term 2023 thing. 2023 is the first year of the rest of your life, right? So uh, think about a long-term plan because I think you are going to have to go gold mining and fishing in other industries probably for at least the next five years and maybe for the rest of the time that you're in the IT industry. So uh, second option is, you know, build your own technician. You know, there's a technician construction kit called education, right? Uh, again, start them out small, give them the piddly jobs, find somebody who can set up a printer and not break the network, find somebody who can, you know, replace a, a switch and uh, not, uh, you know, make it be an all day job. Find somebody who can do the little things and then train them to do the bigger things. Uh, one of the great things about checklists and training is that you can expand the capability of people by simply giving them a checklist. I would never hire somebody with no experience and say, go configure this firewall, but I would give them a checklist and say, you read through the checklist and watch me configure the firewall so that you begin to understand it. And then we're going to give you a little bit of formal training. It, it can be just, you know, a few hours or uh, whatever, one class. Uh, and then say, okay, now show me what you know about this, right? There's a ton of training available from the vendors uh, and the manufacturers. And I, my suspicion is there's going to be more of that going forward because they know that they're dealing with people who have less formal training already. So Add the can do and the will do, and you can build technicians who are really good. So uh, think about how you train them. And remember, most of us became uh, IT consultants on our own because we had bad managers and we decided, you know what, uh, I can run a better business than that. And we may or may not have been right, but that's how we got started. Um, so don't be a bad manager. Be a good manager, right? Uh, this is now a seller's market, meaning that the employees have the upper hand in a long ways. And you have to build culture from day one. So uh, Keith Nelson was talking to my community re recently, uh, and he's from Southern California, and he talked about how on day one, he had people fill out all the paperwork. And then he said, and then I want you to write down all the, the days that your kids have uh, basketball practice or baseball or gymnastics or whatever, so that we know that you're, you're going to take those days off. You know, basically he let people know on day one that they needed to take care of their families, right? And so you need to build that culture as part of your onboarding process. And it's, it, the, it's extremely important that you think about employees as something that you uh, you get to have for a short period of time. Employees are not forever things. People grow up, uh, get degrees, get better jobs, fall in love, you know, uh, move to another city, uh, go move someplace to, you know, take care of their family, whatever. The best employee you have is not going to be with you for 50 years. It, it's almost unheard of. So think about, you know, how long will an employee be with you? And, and just Pick a number, like just say, okay, uh, maybe it's five years. All right. Um, this is not a matter of being lucky if somebody stays with you for five to 10 years. It is a matter of you creating an environment that they want to work in, 
that they are not abused. They are they're held accountable. You give them the opportunity to grow their experience, build up their um, portfolio and move on to the next job as a better technician, uh, a more mature person, uh, a happier person, right? And, you know, it, it's not an option that they won't leave. It's only an option of how long they stay, depending on how well they are treated. So um, there's basically two ways you can treat employees. You can treat them like equipment, right? Which is uh, run them for as many hours as possible until they burn out and, uh, uh, and their parts need to be replaced or treat them like a permanent asset, even though you know they're not, um, and help them improve their skills, help them, you know, the more you give to an employee in terms of their skills and their maturity and their uh, responsibility, uh, the more they have to take with them forever for the rest of their life. And, and that means they're, oddly enough, they're going to stay with you longer uh, if you are building up the skills they need to move away. <laughs> and that's, that's a, a little bit of irony, but I believe it's an absolute truth. So you need to invest in your employees. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, part of your culture is you can't make a decision today and say, oh, I'm going to suddenly be a better boss. I'm going to stop being an a-hole uh, as of Thursday at 2 p.m., right? That's, that's not the way this works. Culture is built slowly. It goes from the top down. Otherwise, it bubbles from the bottom up. Uh, so you are completely in charge of it. You know, if you want a lesson in how to destroy culture, please read, uh, just Google Elon Musk fall 2022. Like what he's doing at Twitter is destroying the culture, destroying the environment, destroying anybody's sense of self-worth uh, or their place within uh, the company. So whether you like Elon or, or not, what he's doing now is a horrible, horrible mistake and may result in the end of Twitter, right? So you need to build a sustainable culture so that the employees that you've invested in, if you work so hard to find, get to stay with you forever or as long as possible. So uh, you, you're going to get the slides as a download, but this is a summary of the most important points. And um, so I'll go with that. Uh, let me give you the 30 second commercial and then we'll answer questions. So if you have not checked out the Small Biz Thoughts technology community, go to smallbizthoughts.org uh, and check it out. If you get in now, you get two, well, you get three major bonuses. First of all, uh, there's going to be a price increase in July of 2023. Uh, if you buy in now, uh, your price is locked in for life. And so you will be exempt from that price increase. Second, uh, we are having an online conference in 2023. All members of the community will get in at no additional charge. Uh, Non-members will pay full price because membership has privileges, uh, copyright, uh, Amex. Uh, and the third bonus, which is ongoing forever and ever and ever, is that um, you get access to all of the classes at IT Service Provider University for free. We currently have 20 classes up there, and we're adding three brand new classes in 2023, um, all of which will be free to members. And uh, oddly enough, the cost of the membership is just a tiny bit more than the cost of three classes. Uh, here are the resources. Again, they're going to be on the slide deck. So with that, I will take any questions. First, I'll take a sip of coffee, and then I'll take any questions you have. Uh, so Dennis says that the uh, number of employees, it's about half and half between enterprise and everybody else. Yeah, it's it's literally like the 48, 52. So it's just almost exactly half and half. The, the point of that is that uh, finding people in SMBIT has been our norm, but we are ignoring half of the market, which is uh, great potential employees. Remember also in all of this, all of the people at, in the small market, the big market, the enterprise, the mid market, we all live in a changing world and we're all watching the same news and we're all you know, going through all of this stuff together. And so, um, you know, you just need to be aware of where you are in the big picture and say, okay, who can I attract? Who would be happy here? And, uh, you know, on this call, I will guarantee 
There is more than one person who has hired somebody out of the enterprise who hated working at a big company. And there's more than one person who has hired somebody out of the enterprise who hated working in small business, right? So uh, it goes, you know, you, you got to right size the, the personality as well as the um, skills and experience. Chris, uh, can you show the summary slide again? Uh, Comcast kicked me out. Oh, summary slide. So, do, 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 do. all right. So, I think you want that one, I believe. Take your screenshot. Um, Lane, so good to see you. Aloha. Uh, when will this talk be posted? Great job on the talk. Oh, uh, the, probably today because my team is so awesome and amazing and I love them and I hope they stay forever and nobody ever leaves me. Uh, so, <laughs> Um, but you know, soon, uh, and, and it will be posted by the way, over at mspwebinar.com, which uh, has only, only, the only S in that is in, is MSP. So MSP webinar with no S at the end.com. Um, cool. Other comments or questions? I had expected way more questions than this. Uh, uh let's see, Chris, I'm on the board for training up, uh, is next week uh, uh, where to locate the, the people? Is, oh, so next week is not where to, this was this was kind of what I'm hoping in terms of where to locate the people. It's, it's the gold mining within your own town and within the industries in your city. Next week is going to be on how to define the jobs, how to write a job description that is appealing to um, you know, prospective clients and uh, how to do the interviews, how to screen, you know, basically everything up until uh, first day on the job. And within the uh, Small Business Thoughts community, we have an entire roadmap that starts with onboarding uh, employees and goes from there. So this is basically the, the day before you onboard, you have to hire. Uh, can you send me your Indeed post for comments? If you are a member of the Small Business Thoughts Technology Community, you may send me your Indeed post, and not only will I give you my comments on it, uh, but uh, if you give me permission, I will anonymously share it uh, next week if it's useful for the webinar. So um, I'd be happy to give anybody feedback on your job postings. Um, I'm a big believer that your job posting can do a lot of things for you um, to pre-screen people who are not a good fit. So, uh, for example, in my job posting, uh, I recently added something at the end, which is I added a line that basically said, um, if you want to work, if you enjoy working in a multicultural environment with lots of people, diverse people from all over the world, you're a good fit here. Well, that's another way of saying if you don't like diversity and you you don't like working with people who are different than you, please don't apply, right? So it, it sort of goes both ways. Um, so anyway, I'm happy to get feedback on that. Uh, Vince, any recommendation on where to get market rates for employees in various roles for local? Are, are market rates even a good benchmark? I would say they're not a good benchmark. Um, the deal is, this is interesting. So um, everybody gets homework. Your homework is, go read uh, Drive by Daniel Pink. Daniel Pink uh, explains why my technicians didn't take extra exams, even though it meant that they were going to get a raise. When people are paid enough money, then money is no longer a motivator for them. Now, this is true in, in you know, knowledge work. This isn't true in, in uh, you know, putting together cars or building things or manufacturing. But in knowledge work, when people have enough money, uh, then offering them additional money doesn't really uh, motivate them. So everybody wants a raise, everybody wants more money, you know, sort of generically. But uh, if people are happy and enjoy their job and they get what they consider to be enough money, they don't go looking for another job. So you need to offer enough um, and if you if you start Googling around, what you'll see is, and in fact, uh, I don't have it in front of me, but the CE Pro uh, has a report on uh, employment in small business. So CE Pro, which is a magazine. Uh, if you go check that out, um, they will give you, I think their latest report is for last year, but basically uh, technicians in North America 
can expect to be paid somewhere between 40, 50, 60, 70,000. 70 is the very high end in small business. Um, so, you know, and, and that actually needs to go up a bit because those numbers haven't really changed much until about 2019, 2020. So it's only been the last few years that we've seen significant increases for salaries of technicians. Um, uh, the URL for the slides, you will get that in an email, uh, but it'll be over at uh, mspwebinar.com. Uh, Greg, uh, we have some great success with regional community colleges. Sometimes these folks are overlooked. Yes, absolutely. So when I talk about like internships and apprenticeships, um, I have often hired people as interns. One time, I think we hired seven people at once. Uh, because we had a huge backlog of work that needed to be done. And we gave people these jobs of like, you know, go in, you know, here, here are the credentials, log into this client, do this thing, go through the checklist, tick, 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 tick. And uh, of those seven, we ended up keeping two of them. <laughs> we offered them real jobs. Uh, but I have often hired technicians to do, I mean, uh, uh, interns to do work for me from community colleges. And it's also, if you want to know where people are getting trained, it's, you know, go to the trade schools. Every trade school in, in North America has a job center and they have one person whose job is to help all of their graduates get employment. And the same thing is true for the technical part of your local community college. They have job boards, uh, which are probably a better place for you to get an employee than indeed.com. Um, so the, the the issue we've had is with poor fit. So so next week we're going to talk about the hiring process. So I'm going to talk next week about how I find a good fit, and it involves having your entire team involved. It is an expensive venture, but every penny you spend filtering people before you hire them is well spent. Because if you get somebody who's a bad fit, then you know. Even at the small end of the market, it just costs money to go back out on the market and try to find another technician, right? So we, we need to, to have a good fit before we make the job offer. And, you know, the most powerful question, I'll give it away. Uh, the most powerful question in that is when somebody comes in for a second, third, fourth, fifth interview, you ask them, what's changed since the last time I saw you? Because there will be people, especially today, who will completely waste your time, but they've already taken a job offer, but they're just going to see if you want to give them more money. And they've already literally accepted another job, but they're coming in for one more interview in case they can talk you into giving them more money. In my opinion, you don't want those people <laughs> as your employees. So anyway, uh, let's see, Andre. Uh, I may have missed it, but did you have any suggestions for sites or programs that work well for training employees? Well, so there's several. Uh, in terms of technical training, most of the local um, uh, you know, learning centers that do various certifications are good. The problem is that a lot of their training is offered as a one-week course for whatever, $3,000, um, I think it's much better to have people engaged in online training where they can have manageable bites. Um, now, having said that, uh, Greg mentioned the community colleges. The community colleges all teach the CompTIA classes. They teach people how to, to become uh, Network Plus or, uh, you know, whatever. Um, and so that's a good place to get them. Uh, on the business side, IT Service Provider University, which is itsp.com, is my training center. Um, and, you know, what we teach on is the business side. So we've got, you know, a technician track and we have a, actually a service manager pathway, uh, uh, front office pathway, sales pathway. So, um, you know, we have five different, you know, tracks that people can take to become certified specifically for be being good employees within a managed service business. And like I said, the, the one class that everybody here can take for absolutely free is 1A, uh, which is the foundations for managed services. And it's just sort of a, what is managed services? And, and you know, it's got an introduction to the philosophy because the way we deliver uh, uh, support in this industry is different, right? Managed services is fundamentally uh, a maintenance-based approach to tech support. 
And so uh, a lot of owners don't know that and a lot of technicians don't know that. Uh, and it, it's just a generic term that they use for, for providing support. And so what happens is a lot of people provide break fix work for a flat fee, um, but they're not really managed service providers. They're just break fix for a flat fee service providers. Uh, Lane, how effective are Indeed comments about your company and hiring the people you're looking for? I've had people that work for me have comments on our Indeed company. Um, I actually don't know the answer to that question. Um, I mean, in general, uh, I think if you are um, a good employer, you can mostly ignore that. Remember that uh, on stuff like that, where people rate their boss and whatever, um, it tends to be disgruntled employees or people who, you know, just thought they were, you know, God's answer to technology that uh, somehow discovered that they are actual people and and they have to be held to somebody else's standards. Uh, they're disgruntled and they leave comments, you know, so... Um, I, I don't know how important it is. I would also say if you're finding places other than Indeed to, to promote, you know, uh, it might be worth, and here's just a odd idea for you, but it might be worth hiring somebody who's got good phone skills to make outbound calls looking for technicians who work for various companies, um, you know, just start saying, hey, you know, I'm, I'm looking for people who do this and that. Um, they're also... Uh, local groups. There are local groups for uh, various meetups for technology, for project managers, for uh, technical people who support dentists or realtors or whatever. Find those groups and go talk to them. And, you know, if you casually mention, hey, I'm looking for, uh, you know, possible technicians, uh, you can gather those resumes. In many ways, Craigslist might be better than Indeed.com, uh, if you are willing to uh, put the filter in the job ad and then uh, do some work. So, all right. Uh, again, I'll, I'll stay as long as you want. If you have additional questions, um, go ahead and put them in the Q&A. And I'm going to take another sip of coffee. I know it's the top of the hour and some folks have another Zoom call because that's what we do. But uh, <laughs> I'll stay as long as you want. Huh. All right. Well, it looks like we lot we we ran out of questions right at the top of the hour. Very good. Well, if you have additional questions, uh and we're done with this screen. Uh I'm Carl P at smallbizthoughts.com. Send me an email. Um, I highly encourage you to check out IT Service Provider University um, and Small Biz Thoughts uh technology community. And, you know, if there's anything I can do in the meantime, send me an email. Um, I get a boatload of email, um, but uh, I will try to get back to you as quickly as I can. If I don't get back to you in what you think is a reasonable amount of time, uh, just resend it and say, hey, I'm putting this on top of your inbox. Uh, Chris, when will the recording be up? My assumption is very soon, uh, probably today or tomorrow. All right, anybody else? Going once, going twice. All right, great. Well, thank you all for registering. Thank you for attending. Thank you for the questions. And um, we will get this up as quick as we can. And I hope, so you're all registered for next week, so you'll get reminders about that. But uh, if you found this at all useful, please tell your friends and neighbors and uh, ask them to sign up as well, even if they're your competition. Thank you all, and I will see you next week. Oh, they can sign up at mspwebinar.com, but I also, you will get an email. <laughs> so share that email with them, share it on social media, and I appreciate that, Andre. Uh,